answer session. And last but not least, we'll have closing and announcement. Okay, so without further ado, let's begin our uh, session. We will start our session uh, with an opening remark by Professor Muhammad Ashari, uh, Rector of Institute Technology, 10 November. Yeah, so I have uh, Prof Ashari here. Hello, Prof. Prof Asari can camera is stopped by the host. Yeah, okay. Can you try again, Prof? Sorry. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Video, video. Ah, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Good afternoon. Selamat sore. Good afternoon, Prof. Good afternoon, can you hear me? Uh, it's not too clear, Prof. I think it's a bit too far. Hello, good afternoon. Selamat yep. sore, bisa, bisa mendengar? Yes, we can hear you. Good, good. Yeah, selamat sore. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, is it my time now? Yep. Yes, you can deliver the opening remark, Prof. Asari. <laughs> thank you. Okay, then. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon and uh, selamat sore untuk semuanya di Indonesia sedang sore ini, pukul uh, 15, ya. Yeah. Uh, 3 o'clock p.m. So, uh, the Honorable Professor Dr. Ing. Uh, Erman Tekaya, the director of the Institute of uh, Metal Forming and Lightweight Component at the TU Dortmund University, German, the Honorable uh, Timo Bazin, the publisher of Sapphire, Netherlands. So, uh, again, uh, the Honorable uh, Sonam. Salaria, Marketing Manager, Elsevier, Southeast Asia, and also uh, Mr. Chian Cheng, Customer Consultant, Elsevier, uh, Southeast Asia, also uh, Mr. Iwan Gafar, the AM, Account Manager, Elsevier, Indonesia, and all uh, distinguished participants, uh, juga para pimpinan, uh, lecturer, uh, senior, uh, Ya, yeah. all the uh, pimpinan ITS yang hadir pada acara webinar, webinar kali ini. So on behalf of uh, ITS Institute Technology 10 November Surabaya, uh, I have a great pleasure to welcome you all uh, join to this uh, conference, online conference best practices in writing and publishing research article for academic communi communities in engineering uh, field. Yeah. So this is a special engineering field. Thank you very much for Pa Edi uh, as the head of ITS library who also uh, organized this uh, conference. Uh, number of writing and publishing research article in Indonesia and especially in um, ITS uh, increase uh, within the last few years. Yeah. Uh, so high <clears throat> of research article publication at university in uh, reputable publisher is very important. Uh, because the Indonesian government also uh, encourages all universities in Indonesia, including ITS, uh, to improve our uh, uh, publication, international publication, especially under uh, reputable uh, publishers. Yeah. So this is one of the uh, key performance indicator uh, every university in Indonesia, especially for a public university like ITS. And uh, we have declared that uh, we, are, we are running in the uh, environment of international uh, reputation, reputable uh, or 
world class university. So, <clears throat> uh, ITS, uh, our vision is to be world class university uh, <clears throat> with international recognition in science, technology, and art. It means that uh, uh, ITS would like to contribute more for the nation, for the world, yeah, in 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 the field of science and technology. And I think this uh, moment, our <coughs> conference here today, uh, would be very important and uh, fruitful for us, especially for ITS, where uh, we are now uh, working very hard. Uh, to publish our research in uh, reputable uh, journal, reputable publisher. So <clears throat> it is an effort to increase the competitiveness of uh, uh, higher education to enhance the quality of uh, publication. So I think this uh, conference or this workshop uh, this afternoon would be very grateful for ITS, for uh, university in Indonesia and all over the world. Because we can see that all the uh, speakers today, uh, it's a special, there's a special and distinguished speakers that uh, uh, came from a reputable uh, uh, publisher. So by this uh, online conference, we hope that uh, we could get uh, understanding on how uh, technically in writing and publishing and listen experiences uh, from researcher, from reviewer, and from uh, distinguished writer. So again, uh, thank you very much for all uh, who arranged this uh, conference and all the distinguished speakers and also all the participants uh, this morning. So, uh, salam sehat uh, selalu from Surabaya and enjoy the uh, webinar. Thank you very much. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay, thank you so much, Professor Ari, for the opening remarks and also for uh, sharing with us you know, how this uh, webinar hopefully can be very useful for all uh, participants. We do hope so. So, uh, uh, and then after the sessions, I do hope that everyone here, uh, not only from ITS Prof, uh, but also from all over Indonesia and even parts in Asia, not only Southeast Asia, but also from Asia can also learn from our speakers. So thank you. Thank you so much for the support as well, uh, Prof. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, we are going to continue yeah, uh, to our session. Yeah, okay, so before we go to our session, I would like to introduce our speaker yeah, for uh, this webinar. Yeah, first, we have Mr. Timo Bazuin, Publishers at Elsevier. So Timo Bazuin is currently Publishers for the Industrial and Manufacturing Engineering Journals at Elsevier managing a list of both property and society journals. He has over seven years experience in working in an STM publishing and has been involved in, launch, in the launch of four journals. And the second speaker that we have is Professor Ar Erman Tekhaya, director of the Institute for Metal Forming and Light Path Components at the TU Dortmund University, Germany. So Professor Erman is currently professor and the director of the Institute for Metal Forming and Light well components at the TU Dortmund University in Dortmund, Germany. The International Prize for Research and Development in Precision Forging of the Japan Society for Technology of Plasticity has been awarded to him in 2014. Dr. Takaya is fellow of the International Academy for Production Engineering and the member of the Duke. Okay, I will <laughs> not be able to pronounce this, but for DGM. <laughs> He is the editor in chief of the Funds in Industrial and Manufacturing um, Engineering and was the chair of the, the editorial committee of the CIRP Annals and the former editor in chief of the Journal of Materials Processing Technology. He is member of 
uh, the board of trustees of the German Research Association of Steel Applications and is member of the uh, Senate of the TU Dortmund Universities. Yeah. I uh, got a chance to check the profile of Professor Ehrman and he published over 230 peer reviewed papers, several books, and has over 30 patents granted or uh, filed. Yeah. So we are looking forward to hear from Timo and also from Professor Ehrman. And for our first session, I'm going to give the stage to Timo. Yep, off to you, Timo. Thank you. Thank you, Johan. And thank you, everyone, for uh, yeah, the invitation and for the warm welcome. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So I'll just um, start sharing my screen. And before I start presenting, I would also, of course, like to thank Professor Takaya for accepting the invitation to, to join me today in, in this presentation. It's, it's a great pleasure to, uh, to be able to do this together. Um, so today, what we really want to do is we want to focus on how to write, how to write a good journal article and how to structure it, how to increase the chances of publication and what does it really take, of course, to, to be able right, to, to write an article that is, that is very uh, publishable. And the way that we've uh, envisioned that is really that I will be mainly focusing on the writing process and that Professor Takaya will really be focusing as well on, on writing, but also more on the, on the research part of, of course, the, the papers. So I first would like to start off by telling you a little bit about the publisher's role uh, within the uh, process. So what do publishers do in, in general to add value to the scientific communities? That's basically, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's listed here on the list, of course. We really make sure that everyone writes that there's an official um, timestamp available for who submitted for certain scientific results first. Um, and of course, right, in this way, we build up a scientific record. Uh, certification of the findings of the research that has been done through uh, Right, through basically enabling the peer review process and uh, facilitating this. We help uh, disseminate the, the findings, so uh, making sure that it's um, widely available. And of course, these days, uh, journals and of course, the research articles are available uh, online um, in, in the various ways. One of which is, of course, the Science Direct platform that Elsevier has, where millions and millions of articles can be found. And um, yeah, of course, part of the dissemination is also ensuring right, that, that papers are, are findable through indexing services, um, search engines, and, and, and those places. Uh, preservation, so really making sure that the record is being preserved for future generations. And usage, so really making sure that right, all of the articles, all of the research, that it's, um, yeah, that, that the end user, the readers can, can, can use the articles and, and, and work on that as well. So when it comes to writing an article, um, basically in, before you start, it's really good to ask yourself the following questions. And it's, it's written down here in, in a way, right? Stop and go. So if you feel that the work that you have done is new and original, that you can refine the results, and that, right, that, that, that it's a, a review of, of a certain subject, it's, it's, it's possible to move forward if, of course, the, the findings and the work is outdated, if it's duplicated, or if it's not factual, so it's incorrect, then it's probably not good, it's not a good time yet to, to start writing an article. What, of course, is one of the most important things to, uh, to, to realize and, and to come to these conclusions is really make sure that you're um, aware of the current literature. So it's, it's really... Um, yeah, it's, it's really recommended to first do a literate, uh, literature review to see what, you know, what, what the current standings are, what the current, the most current research is, 
um, out there at the moment and take it from there. So really make sure that you have that frame of reference before you start. And then, yeah, these are some additional questions that, you, that, that, that should be asked. So is it something new and interesting? Have you provided solutions to difficult prob uh, problems that are, of, co of course, of interest to readers, to researchers within the field? Have you checked the latest results? That's basically what I, uh, what I just mentioned as well. And have you verified the findings do your results fit? Is a complete story. So planning the manuscript is, of course, of, of the utmost importance. It's, it's really important to do this. So what you have to make sure is that the scientific message that you want to get across is clear, useful, and exciting. Readers should be wanting to read the paper. And of course, the initial readers in this case will be editors in chief who receive the manuscripts when they are submitted and the reviewers if the paper is sent out for peer review. So of course, it's, it, it needs to be clear, it needs to be useful, it needs to be exciting. It needs to, of course, be presented in a, in a logical and construct, you know, in a logical manner. So it, you, you should really guide the reader through the process and they should be able to arrive at the same conclusions as you, right, as the author. And then finally, yeah, um, it's important that it, it should be enable, right, the readers to, to grasp the significance, the importance of the research that you've done. And of course, the more effort you put into the preparation of the manuscript, the more likely the chances are that you'll eventually be accepted. And yeah, as, as indicated uh, in the slide, editors, reviewers, as I also mentioned, and the readers all want to receive well-presented manuscripts that fit within the Amazon scripts of the journal. So it's really important to focus on that and keep that in mind when preparing a manuscript. So a good starting point to look at um, when preparing the manuscripts. And, and let's say you would like to submit, to, for example, advances in industrial and manufacturing engineering, which is the new journal that is led by Professor Takaya. It's very important to look at the aims and, uh, the aims and scope, but also at the guide for authors. Um, and the guide for authors is available on the journal's homepage. So always, do take the time to visit the journal's homepage. Look at both of these, um, both of these summaries. So the guide for authors, the engine scope, and make sure that your manuscripts uh, fits the Amazon scopes, but also that it adheres right to the to the guide for authors. And it will really save you a lot of time. Um, so it takes some time. You need to invest some time to do this, but it will save you time eventually because yeah it really will help in the formatting and, and they can, it, it will increase the chances right of, of, of writing a good paper so it's important also to uh, to have a look and, and to consider right what type of papers does the journal accept and um yeah to, to also have a good think about what type of manuscripts you're planning to uh, to submit and in general we we, we, we distinguish these three um, article types. These are the most prevalent, I would say, uh, with full articles being uh, the most frequently used. These are really yeah, substantial, complete, comprehensive pieces of research. So the question to ask is really, is my message, is my message sufficient for a full article? We also have letters and short communications. Um, and of course, it's important to check whether the journal accepts that. Some journals are really solely focused on letters and short communications. And often uh, you can see that in the journal title as well. And most of the times these are the early findings. Um, so it's, it's really, it's at a stage where preliminary results uh, are available. And yeah, it's, it's really one question to, 
The answer is, are my results that exciting, right? Are they so thrilling that they should be shown as soon as possible? And finally, of course, one paper, uh, one article type that, that a lot of journals um, cover are a few articles. And that's really more of a summary on, on the recent developments within a certain field or on a certain topic. And oftentimes these uh, are by invitation. So the editor will invite someone to write a, a review. But it's also possible to, of course, reach out to the journal, reach out to the editor, and, and yeah, um, discuss this. And yeah, so the next slide is really more on the preparation, and it's on the scientific uh, language. So writing, write with clarity, writing objectively, writing accurate, and be sure that you're um, yeah, that you write with brevity. So it's, all of these things are really, really important. So the key to successful writing is to be aware of, of some of the errors that we've listed here. And these are really, they, they really have to do with language. So it's the construction, is the, is the sentence, does it make sense or is it difficult to read? Of course, we need to ensure that it's yeah, that, that, that is very easy to read for um, the, the readers, for the editors, for the reviewers. Tenses, so, right, um, not having, um, yeah, matching tenses within one sentence. Inaccurate grammar, and of course, one of the, one of the concerns could also be that it, it, it's just very important to make sure that you use English because that's really... Yeah, the language, of course, for the uh, international scientific community. Um, it's also good in the Guide for Authors to check uh, the language specifications. So some journals really have a preference for British uh, English or American English. Most of the times it's possible to do both, but really do make sure that it's consistent. That's, I think, is, is most important. Then we'll look at the structure of an article. So basically, this, right, the, 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 we can distinguish these two um, sections here. The first section is really, it consists out of the title, abstract, and keyword. And then we have the main article, which is the introduction, the methods, the results, and discussion, conclusion, acknowledgement, references, and supporting um, materials. And well, the title and the abstract and the keywords are actually very, very important because it's, it's more or less, it's, it's one of the first things, right, that an editor looks at, I would say, when, when they receive a paper. Look at the title, they look at the abstract and at the keywords to see, does this match the journal? Is this what we're looking for? Is it clear to me based on these three sections um, what the reader is is trying to convey, and of course these these three things that the title, option, and the keyword are also very important uh, in case the article, of course, is published. Um, that it, it's it's important for indexation and to make sure that the article is searchable, and it it increases, of course the chances of finding the article. So always, it's, it's very important that I'll come back to this at a, at a later stage at a, in this presentation. So the buildup, of course, is, is somewhat different from the way that the research has been conducted. The, the buildup is really as shown on this slide. Most of the times, I would say, so we start at the bottom here with the figures and the tables. Right, and that's of course, that's the data. These are your findings. From there, you start to build. And it's really in this sense that the methods, so you describe which methods have been used to try and tackle the, the, the research question that you're trying to answer. What are your results? What are the results, right, following the methods? Then the discussion around the results. Um, from, there, from here, the conclusion, uh, should follow, of course, and that most of the time will follow quite easily. Um, and then, of course, an introduction, like how does the 
where does the work fit within uh, the field as a whole? How is this of, of relevance and importance? From here, um, it's, it's, it's a good thing to, to, to move towards the title, the abstract and the keywords. And yeah, we've, uh, we've really seen that building and structuring an article in this way is, is easier, it's, it's more logical and more effective. Um, so now I'm going to uh, focus a bit on the different sections. So as described for it, the, we, we start off with the, with the findings, with the data, with the, uh, you know, with, with the materials that we, uh, that we have. And then if we look at the methods, uh, it's, it's really important in this section, right, to describe how you've studied the, the problem. It should be done in a way that it's reproducible. So let's say I'm an expert within the same field. I should be able to use, uh, follow the steps within the article that, that, that have been described. And I should be able to come to the same conclusions as you as the researcher and the author have reached. Um, it's important, of course, also to identify Right, the equipment that's been used and the materials that's, that have been used, because of course there can be uh, differences, there will be differences in, in equipment and not all equipment will lead to the, to the same outcome. So th there can be some variety there. Um, and then of course, it's also important to not describe previously published um, uh, procedures. You shouldn't be writing that in detail you can reference those, right, or describe them in the supporting materials section. And then we go to the results section. So in this section, it's, it's, um, it's very important. The data of the paper is really the driving force, right, of, of the paper. And the figures and illustrations are really critical and there, and it's important that this is really your essential data. So any data that you have that is of less importance, right, of secondary importance should be put into supporting or supplementary material section. Well, um, the, the legends that you use for a figure should be very brief. It should be, it should contain sufficient explanatory details to explain the figure without the need to refer to the text. And it's, it's of, course, of course good to structure to, to have a good uh, logical structure here. So important, right, in the results section is include all of your illustrations, include only, right, the most important data, highlight these main findings within the notes, right, within the legend, and really make sure that the figures can basically, right, stand on their own in, in, in that sense that, a reader doesn't have to go back into the into the text to make sense of what is presented there. Um, well, it's it's also of course important to highlight findings that further understanding within the field, and yeah, really yeah, focus again on on making sure that things are concise and that they're clear. Uh, discussion is really considerably, right, arguably the, the most important section of an, of an article. So it's really where you interpret what your results mean. And this is a good opportunity, right, to sell your data in a sense that, yeah, it's, it's, it's important to um, make sure, right, that the discussion corresponds to your results. It complements the results but it doesn't repeat the results. So really make sure that it's really, really good. It should compare your work to other published work and findings out there. And also, of course, work that, that is in disagreement with yours. So I think that's actually a very good opportunity to confront the other work, right? To, 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 to have a, a comparison there and to try and convince anyone that is reading your work that your research is right, correct or is better than, than the previous work. So a few things that are of importance here is, is to really make sure that you do not go beyond what your results can support. 
um, that you use quantitative descriptions in the sense that, right, it, it should be, um, yeah, really uh, specific expressions and not expressions such as a higher temperature, a lower rate, really do make that measurable and make sure that, that people can, can look it up. Um, do not introduce any new terms that you've not already defined within your paper. And also do not speculate, but always really make sure that it's factual. And yeah, I think that that is, um, is very important for the discussion section. Conclusion, um, this is really to provide a justification um, of your work in a sense that it should explain how your work um, fits within the field and how it further advances the field. So how it will add to the scientific record that the journal is actually building. So this really ties in as well, right, with what was mentioned earlier about the role of publishers, the role of journals and the preservation part so really what is happening is that a journal is building this scientific record and articles should not be repeating, right, uh, findings, but ideally, um, yeah, we're, we're moving in a, in, a, in a direction where every paper really is, is aiming to, to come up with new findings and that all of these findings really advance the field. So it's good to provide a... Um, clear justification for how your work uh, does this. And you can do this by, for example, indicating uses of your work, extensions, possible applications, right? And um, yeah, it's, it's also good to suggest future experiments that could build on your work and point out perhaps relevant experiments that might or might not be uh, underway already. Um, then the references. So yeah, this is um, this of course uh, very very important because this really right as as mentioned earlier as well. It's it's not a good thing to rewrite in detail the work that is already out there. That's really something that we should do in the reference list. We should uh, point to early earlier research in this manner. So you should use this to cite the work that you've used, right, to, that, that you're basing your work on as well. Make sure to not include too many references. So really make sure, right, that, that it's, it's only references that are very needed, um, that are essential. And the same goes for references to your own previous work. Really make sure to do this only in moderation, so really only the, the most essential ones. And yeah, it really is important to, to include references. Also, if you, for example, were to reuse um, parts of your own previous work, so let's say you want to refer to previous work and, and you reuse a figure, you reuse uh, a, a, a Part of a paragraph, make sure to, to, to put in the references because there really is such a thing as self-plagiarism as well. Um, well, it's, it's really good, right, to um, make sure that you have fully absorbed and understood the material that you've referenced. So don't just rely on excerpts or on isolated sentences, really know and own your references. And yeah, make sure, of course, again, to check the guide for authors to make sure that the references are listed in the proper format. And this really, really helps a lot also for the editors and it will increase your chances again to... Introduction is really, uh, yeah, it, it is aimed to provide the context for, um, for your manuscript and to convince readers once again why your work advances the, the field or uh, of study. It's important to be conci uh, concise, so don't say anything more. I right? don't say something in five sentences that you can say in, in one sentence. Um, and yeah, it's 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 really important, right? To um, you, yeah, that, that you really introduce um, 
some of the main publications that your work is 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 really based on. Um, cite some original and important work here, um, but don't turn it into a history lesson, really. So, um, yeah, really make sure to 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 make um, once again um, to, to to only have very relevant references here. So things that you want to do in the introduction is that you make sure that you clearly address uh, the main problem that you're trying to solve, that you identify possible solutions and limitations. Are there solutions, right? What would be the best solution? What is the limitation? Provide a pers perspective as well uh, that is consistent with the journal that you're submitting to. One very, very important thing as well is really to make sure that you do not reuse any introductions that you've used previously. Every um, introduction should really be original. Um, then really the title. And the title, of course, as mentioned earlier, is really one thing that's really, really important in the indexation process and making sure that your paper uh, can be found. Um, I've used the title here um, by Professor Takaya. Um, and what I really like about it is that it's short, it's extremely concise, and everyone really knows what this paper is about. And, and these are yeah, really, really important things to, 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 you know, for, for any title, actually. So it um, should attract attention. Um, it should be really concise, it should be specific, shouldn't be using any technical uh, jargon out there. So really, really make sure that anyone, anyone would be able to interpret that, um, that, that has a bit of a background and, and an interest in the field. And it should be really appropriate for the audience. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's very important also, once again, uh, for the initial readers, which are really the editors and, and the possible reviewers. Um, and I, I, I do know that editors and reviewers, they don't make comments that do not make a lot of sense or do not accurately represent the, uh, the subject. The abstract is really, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it should be really short. Um, it's always freely available in abstracting and indexing services such as the Web of Science, PubMed, Medline, Embase, and, and Scopus. And it's really a single paragraph in general. So what it should do is be a summary of the problem, the methods, the results, and the conclusion. And um, yeah, it should be quite clear. It should be easy to understand, and it should be uh, a bit of an appetizer, I, I should say, to, for a reader to want to read more about this. You should really try and encourage, right, and, and excite the editor and the reviewers to want to read the paper and to get to know more and to, 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 to be curious about the findings that are presented. And yeah, it's, um, it's, it's, it's in a way, it's comparable, I, I would say, to a good movie trailer, or perhaps to, uh, yeah, a, a letter that goes with, with an application. Of course, it's completely different, but it's it's something that, yeah, we would want to uh, encourage someone, right, to, to want to know more, to want to read more, and to, yeah, want to have them uh, continue reading. And it really, really is important in, in increasing the chances of, of getting published. Um, keywords are basically labels or tags for your manuscripts that are really um, helpful in, in indexing and abstracting, also, of course, in, in search engines. And what you should try to do is avoid words with very broad meanings. So if the meaning is too broad and I do a search on Google or any search engine out there or in Scopus, I get way too many hits. Um, so it's really um, also important to only use abbreviations that are very, very well established, such as DNA, um, but do not use any, any abbreviations that right, are 
are yeah, not, not very well known because that can lead to con confusion. Um, and some journals, it's also important to know some journals have special requirements here. Um, so for certain journals, they actually have a keyword list available. Um, so important, once again, to check the guide for authors uh, to see if this is a case, uh, if this is the case for the journal that, that you uh, want to submit your paper to. So as we can see in this example, right, some of the keywords here are forming, joining, plastic, deformation, and the index keywords here are forming, friction, stir, stir welding, plastic deformation, product design, and yeah, it's, it's really, it's really, really important, once again, in, in trying to get your paper uh, searchable uh, and, and that, it's, that, that researchers can find it. Choosing the right journal. So, of course, very, very important. You want to have your uh, research and your findings um, meet right, with the journal. It should be in the, in the, in the journal that is most it is. Uh, so really do make sure to, 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 to pay a lot of attention to this by reading the aims and scope. And of course, right, one of the most important things about having the right journal is that you will reach the intended audience for your work. So if, for example, right, there's a paper on um, plastic deformation, um, and it's submitted to a journal on marine biology, of course, that's not really going to be of, of that, right? It's, it's a silly uh, example, but it's, it's just to, to indicate how important this is. Um, so, important thing to know is to only pick one journal at a time. Um, simultaneous, simultaneous submissions are not allowed. And in, in most cases, we find out um, editors will know. Um, and in, 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 in those instances, so if, if, if we find out right, that a paper has been submitted to, to, to multiple journals at the same time, um, editors right, and publishers as well will not really be happy. And it, it can have serious repercussions in a sense that uh, a paper might be rejected, or when it's published, um, it, it could even lead to retraction in that sense. And it, it's, it's just not good. So please do not do this. Uh, do not gamble, do not take the risk. Um, again, of course, super, your supervisor, your colleagues, based on the work that you've presented, right, that you've written, can really uh, also surely come up with, with good suggestions. And um, a lot of publishers, uh, such as Elsevier, also have tools available on the web. One of our tools, for example, is called the Journal Finder. What you can do there is really put in your title, put in your keywords, put in your abstracts, and based on certain algorithms, you get um, candidate journals, right? possible journals for your research. Um, but of course, do make sure to investigate them, to really focus on the aims, the scope, the earlier published work, the readership, and, and you know, the, the current topics that, that, are, uh, that are published there. Also important to note, and I'm sure that this is not new to, to most of you, is that the articles right, that you've used in your reference list can, of course, also give you a good indication of, of where you would like to publish your, your journal, uh, your paper. So I want to... And my part of the presentation of this webinar really with some final uh, notes and that's really on authorship and on best practices. So right, authorship, um, on this slide, we have some of the, the principles for who's listed first. So first author is really the one that conducts or supervises the data analysis and a proper presentation and interpretation of the results. It's the one that puts the paper together and submits. Co-authors are really people that make intellectual contributions to the data analysis and interpretation. They review each paper draft and they must be able to present the results, defend the implications, and of course, discuss the study limitations. 
at any point. Things really to avoid is ghost authors, so that's really leaving out authors that should be included, or um, yeah, really have scientific writers or gift authors in a sense that right, including authors, including people as an author that have not had significant contributions. Very, very important. Um, then the next slide really is right to to is is to follow up on this. So there's no one universal definition on authorship, um, but in general, right, it's it's basically as I described earlier, one of the journals, one 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 committee of medical journal editors has declared that an author really must adhere to these four points that are listed here. So it's really substantial contribution to the conception and design, acquisition of data, or the analysis and interpretation of the data, and the and draft the article or revise it critically from important into uh, for important intellectual content, and give their approval, and of course agree to be accountable for all of the aspects that are uh, described um, here or within the work, and of course, the accuracy and integrity of any part of the, the work. So it's it's really important, right, to really make sure that anyone that is listed as an author, um, yeah, meets this criteria. Any other, uh, any people, right, that, that do not meet this can be listed as acknowledged individuals, so really put them in, in the acknowledgements. Um, some of the key author responsibilities, really, really important as well. Report only real and unfabricated data. Make sure that your work is original so that it's not plagiarized. Declare any possible conflicts of interest. And the conflict of interest here, of course, would be that you're um, doing research, right? But you you have certain interests, either with a company or or in any other way or form that that will that that can in you know that, that can basically lead to a certain bias and again really make sure to only submit to one journal at a time i also want to right, make clear that these are some of the most serious um issues to avoid so these are the most the three most common uh, forms of misconduct that we see and of course, right, papers are, are screened for, um, for for this type of misconduct. And, and if, right, if any, any of these things is found within a submission, that's of course not. Um, it, can, it can really have serious repercussions again. So the three most important um, and, and most, most seen forms of ethical misconduct are really fabrication. So it's really making up certain data so you cannot really back it uh, in a scientific manner uh, false falsification so that you really manipulate certain data um, to fit certain trends and and plagiarism is really yeah taking previous uh, work or taking work uh, for example by other authors that has not been published yet and passing it off as as your own and um yeah, it's 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 really really important to uh, to avoid these things. And finally, um, it's it's really um, this this ties in with submitting to only one journal at the time, so it should be avoided where manuscripts uh, describe essentially the same research and that they're published in more than one journal or or right, primary publication. Um, so that's really. Um, multiple or redundant uh, publication in that sense. Um, an author should avoid at any time to submit previously published articles just in general for consideration in any other journal. Uh, duplication of the same paper in multiple journals or in different languages or of different languages is should be avoided as well. And something that we refer to as salami slicing, which is really using the same research, but turning it into multiple papers is considered manipulative and also should be discouraged. It can really also once again lead to retractions.
So that's, um, yeah, the, these are some final findings, some final important things that I wanted to share today. So this is really it for, uh, for my part of the presentation. And I'm now going to hand over first to, to Johan and then to uh, Professor Takaya, of course. So thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Steve. Sorry. <laughs> thank you. We have we already have quite a lot of questions in the Q and A, and I believe that more questions will be coming from our attendees. Yeah, and again for our attendees, yeah, you can ask your questions using the Q and A uh, box, yeah, uh, which you can see in your uh, Zoom. Okay. So again, thank you so much, uh, Timo. Uh, of course, you can take a look at the questions, and later on we will have the uh, discussion with you as well. Okay, so now we are moving to Prof. Takaya. Yeah, uh, so Prof. Takaya, you can uh, start uh, your session. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much uh, for giving me this opportunity. Can you see my screen? Yep, we can see. Yeah, very good. Very good. Uh, I'm sorry, I just lost uh, some faces here. Uh, okay, good. I will start uh, with my uh, presentation by thanking for invi inviting me. Uh, this is a very nice uh, opportunity uh, for me and uh, for all of you to get uh, a little bit more acquainted with uh, the uh, issues of uh, publishing. Um, I'm thanking also to Timo, he made an excellent uh, introduction to publishing and uh, I'm working with him for uh, several uh, years in different uh, journals and uh, we know each other very well and I know how much dedicated he is uh, for academic publishing and uh, therefore I'm very happy to share the screen with him together today. So, uh, my presentation is about the research pro process and publishing a paper. Um, I'm from the Dortmund uh, University in Germany, and uh, currently I am the editor-in-chief of the uh, new journal Advances in Industrial and Gold uh, and Manufacturing uh, Engineering. That's a gold open access journal. And within my experience I had also from my previous journal, GMPT, a journal for materials processing and technology, and also the CRP annals, uh, which I chaired, uh, where I chaired the scientific board uh, there, uh, editorial board there. Uh, I would like to give some points from my point of view as an editor. And with that, <clears throat> I would like to start with the research part. If you want to publish something, this should be based on good research. If you don't have good research, it doesn't matter how you make the, or write the paper, how nice you draw the figures, uh, how good you format the paper, how nicely you reply to the editor, this will all not help. A good research which leads to an archival publication is the fundamental issue. And I would like to talk a little bit about this. So my first point is, uh, what are the steps of research? First of all, you have to determine the need for the research you are doing. So the question you have to ask you yourself is what do we need to know what is not known now? So you have to find the gap uh, in the topic. Then you have to make a literature survey. What knowledge exists in order to answer the question related to the need? And if there is a difference between the literature and the need, that's the research gap. And that's the gap you have to fill with your research. The next step is to make a proposal how you are going to fill that gap. That means you have to think about a model, a solution technique, uh, or experiment, or a system, uh, how you will solve this knowledge gap. And after you have this proposal, 
you develop your solution, you develop your methodology, implement it. And then, most important, after you have done the implementation, you have applied your method, you have to evaluate. You have to evaluate, and for that purpose, you have to go back to the gap and see whether the results you achieved are filling the gap. So you had a hypothesis, you had a hypothesis to fill a gap. Have I really uh, filled it? You have to check that. And you have to uh, clearly make it uh, to anyone who reads your paper. And finally, you can suggest further studies for the continuation of work, which is always good, showing that you are uh, thinking in long terms and not for just a paper. Okay, so uh, the golden rule is to start the study with the literature survey. I already uh, said this, and uh, in this uh, in this sense, it is important to uh, make a literature survey not only uh, among your colleagues, not only in the last year. You have to find all the relevant papers, as Timo said uh, very nicely. Okay, this is, in my eyes, the most important thing. In order to make an archival paper, you have to make a scientific contribution. And the question is, what is a scientific contribution? A scientific contribution can be threefold. It can be a novel work, a uh, novel idea, I'm going to explain that in a minute. Plus, it must be delivered transferable knowledge. This is very important. And finally, it must have a scientific quality. That is, it must be based on physical laws. It must be based on analytical evaluation and thinking. And it should have no fakes. So let us look a little bit more deeper to novel work. What is novel work? Novel work could be a new theory. You can have a new theory which was not existing about the process and describe it. It can be a new technology, a new innovative technology, which includes a process or a machine or a tool or even materials. You can invent new materials, new, new composite materials. It might be also the application of existing theory to or a technology to a new field. So you might take over a theory, for instance, the theory of plasticity, and apply it to a new process. That could be also a novel work. And finally, significant new knowledge that is applicable to different processes can be developed. So you can have a list of known processes, but for those processes, you develop a method by which you generate new knowledge, which is applicable for a whole batch of uh, processes. So your research work should fulfill one of those items. The next point is, I said a good work should supply transferable knowledge. What could be transferable knowledge? It could be, for instance, for a manufacturing process. I'm a manufacturing uh, researcher, so most of my examples are coming from manufacturing, but you can extend this to any other field. So it could be a working window for a manufacturing process. If you establish a working window for a manufacturing process, you have uh, trans provided a transferable knowledge. You can quantify effects of process parameters experimentally, Theoret uh, theoretically or numerically. Uh, quantitative properties of products. You can develop methods by which you can determine quantitative properties of products after manufacturing. That can be also experimental or numerical or theoretical. You don't need to have uh, only a theoretical uh, approach. You can have also an experimental approach to describe that. You can develop a theoretical model, that's the most condensed way of transferable knowledge. 
a complete process description, material properties, and applicable software, which can be used by uh, several other people. And of course, there are many other items which uh, you can think about among transferable knowledge. But this is a very basic issue. Why am I telling that to you? I'm telling that to you because as an editor-in-chief in my former uh, journals, and also in this journal, about 80% of the papers are rejected before I send them to any reviewer. We call that desktop projection. And the reason is that any of or one of those items is not fulfilled. So you should pay attention to this. Okay, so, and then if you have all that, you might have the wish to publish. And scientific publishing can have different purposes. One purpose is to distribute the knowledge acquired and hence contribute to the scientific development. I think this is one of the most important purposes. We would like to contribute to the level of science in the world. To obtain the rights on the novel contribution. So you have found something and you would like to have the rights. It's like a patent. A publication is like a patent. A patent on your ideas, on your work. To receive the comments of peers and improve your own work. And I just made it bold because this is very important. That's very much related to the journal to which you send your paper. So some of my students uh, are very happy if they get no uh, rejection and no comments uh, from the reviewers. That's the wrong attitude. The peers, those people who know the subject, who know it maybe better than you, have to criticize your work, have to give you comments so that you can develop and your paper can develop and the whole community can uh, get a better feedback of your work. And of course, uh, another item is to raise your own reputation. I mean, in the academic world, uh, most of the uh, promotions are based on publications and uh, similar uh, activities. And of course, as important to raise the reputation of your institution, your university and your country. So, in that sense, it's extremely important to select a journal not making an easy review, to select a journal with a strong editorial board, with strong reviewers, and making a tough review so that you can improve your work at the highest level. So, then the question is, what is a good paper? A good paper is a paper that makes that contribution providing insight into the processes and material and which can be used in the future by other people. And a good paper is a paper where the knowledge is transferable, coded in equations, formulated in concise statements, and supported by experiments and theoretical evidence. Remember, I said you have always to check your uh, hypothesis by uh, some discussion and to check a mathematical model, to check a uh, conceptual model can be done basically only by experiments, especially in uh, mechanical engineering. So, and as Timo said very nicely, opinions are of little value. Don't use uh, words by which you try to say, oh, I found an excellent result. Uh, Comparison was very good and very successful. This is something which comes not by your words, which comes by uh, the results you show on the, in the paper. Okay, with that, I would like to come to the scientific publishing in a little bit uh, from a different viewpoint. Uh, I will touch all the points which uh, Timo mentioned already, but from more an uh, editor point of view. So, the authorship I will skip because that has been uh, very nicely uh, listed by and uh, explained by Timo. I just want to emphasize that the authorship is extremely important here. Uh, an important other thing is the cover letter. So, 
let me tell you one important uh, fact. An editor-in-chief is a very busy person, and he has little time to make judgments. And what the editor-in-chief is reading is your title of the paper, the abstract of the paper, the cover letter, and the conclusions. So, those are the four things we have to read in every paper. And therefore, it's extremely important to make those four items very concise, very solid. So, one of those items is the cover letter. <laughs> and what I see mostly is that uh, many authors put in the cover letter the abstract of the paper. That's not the aim. You should emphasize the speciality of the uh, paper, not the abstract. For instance, this is an example here. The uh, author sent me a letter and he wrote, this manuscript is unique. It is unique. So you have to emphasize that and you have to say, why is it unique? And then he explained. Another example from another author. Here he explains the relevance of the test. He developed a test and he wants to show why this test is so important. He doesn't make, he doesn't write an abstract. He emphasizes the speciality of the paper. So he lists the three aspects of the paper. Here is another a nice cover letter. So here the author uh, wrote me, this manuscript describes, oh sorry, this manuscript describes a novel proposal cutting a pattern in the undeformed blank prior to incremental sheet forming, etc. So he tries to make the editor interested in the topic. And this is also a nice uh, cover letter because the author recognized that the paper was too long. So he wrote a review on the mechanics of spinning and the paper was quite long. And uh, usually editors do not like too long papers, but if there is a reason, everything is welcome. So the author said, you will notice that the paper is too long, but you have made, but we have made a considerable effort to examine the literature in English, German, and Japanese. And by that, he explains, uh, the authors explain uh, the reason why the paper is so long. So then, I'm coming to the sections uh, Timo explained uh, from the reviewer point of view. So if you write the introduction, which should have uh, the items why we need the research work and uh, what is the reason uh, or what is the benefit for the practice and so on. So the reviewer can comment this section immediately with, from the negative point of view. This research is not important. You select such a tiny problem, it doesn't matter whether you publish something on that topic or not. Or the problem is too specific and clearly does not lead to transferable knowledge. For instance, let me give you an example. You might write, it is a considerable problem to uh, press the left uh, door uh, of a Mercedes car uh, of the model S uh, in the color blue, okay? So, if this is the problem, there is no transferable knowledge. It's a very specific problem. So, you have to make the introduction clear that the problem you are considering is an uh, interesting problem. Then, the second part comes, analysis of existing work. That's your literature survey. Here, the reviewer may comment the claimed knowledge gap does not exist. So you are looking for a gap so that you can justify your research. And if you cannot find that gap, your paper is going to be rejected. You have failed to connect the state, the state of need to the previous work. You haven't understood the existing work that you have quoted. That's a very critical point. Usually the papers go to expert reviewers. And usually those expert reviewers have a lot of papers on the subject. And if you miss those work, then you have a problem. If you miss very fundamental work, how can you find fundamental work? Those are papers with the 
most citations. And then the paper only represents established textbook knowledge. This is also a very common point. If you start to write a paper on deep drawing, don't explain what is deep drawing. That's textbook knowledge. And the evaluation of the previous work is not fair. So you may have some concurrency with some other uh, work, and then you may just uh, negatively uh, explain their achievement. And then the most important part comes, proposal. Here, you should give your method, your theory, your procedure. The reviewer can comment that and say, just a minute, the proposal is arbitrary. So there is no specific connection to the problem. Or you have made assumptions you haven't stated, or which are untested, or which are untestable. So we can not make a theory by assuming, for instance, if you are going to uh, make a plastic deformation process, uh, let us come back to deep drawing and say, let's assume the material is elastic. That will not work. In that case, the paper will be uh, rejected. Or the reviewer may say, you have oversimplified the problem. I mean, making assumptions is essential in models, but making reasonable assumptions. So you have oversimplified the problem or the proposal is too restrictive and makes too many assumptions, or the proposal clearly won't work, the proposal is wrong, the derivation contains an error, that this proposal is incomplete, it cannot reasonably be tested. So those are questions which may come up. And then the design, test, and implementation comes. Here again, the reviewer can say, oh, the test does not prove anything, the test is wrong. The test is oversimplified. The test is false. And I'm doing a little bit faster. The results and evaluation part comes. Here, the reviewer might say the results are too specific and apply only to one situation. Think about the car of a Mercedes, uh, the left uh, door of the Mercedes in blue. Uh, this is a very specific uh, situation. So any forming process related to this specific product is too, too uh, specific. Your interpretation of the results is wrong. So you might get a result and you interpret it so that you can support your theory, but your interpretation is absolutely not physical. You claim more than you have proved. That happens very often. So you end up with a wonderful test and then uh, you have a lot of results but you read out of those results, results which are not there. And if that happens, the paper will be rejected, of course. Discussion and conclusions. Here, what the reviewer might negatively say is, the work is incomplete, you haven't gone far <coughs> enough, or you haven't understood the context of your proposal. You made a proposal and end up with something completely different. You have missed the implications of your evaluation. You did not understood how the results affect your procedure. And then the final session section, acknowledgement. Here you should ensure that anyone who helped you in the research is recognized. That can be the financial supporters, that can be the proofreaders, that can be the typist, which we don't have anymore. Every one of us is writing the paper him or herself. Suppliers who may have provided materials free of charge. If you have paid money, you don't have to mention them. Contributions of each author. Uh, Timo showed uh, in that respect also uh, some information. Uh, so what you shouldn't put in the acknowledgement are personal issues. So I had one paper, I remember, where the author wrote, I'm thankful to my uh, primary school teacher, so-and-so, because he gave me the inspiration of uh, science and math and so on. So uh, that's, that does not fit very well in the acknowledgement of an archival paper. Yeah, uh, it's a very good a practice, a new practice, uh, a recent practice, to show the contributor role taxonomy uh, for the authors. So by that 
you list at the end of your paper each author and write the contribution. There is a web page which explains how to do that. So I'm not going to much in the details here. And the final thing, which is in fact the first part you write after the title is the abstract. Write the abstract at the end of the paper. The abstract is very important. Every editor is reading this abstract and you shouldn't write in the abstract the literature survey. That's not the purpose. Write what you have achieved. Write what is new in your paper and make it short, make it clear. Assume that the editor knows the subject. Assume that the reviewers know the subject. So if I read an abstract, I made my decision about 50% to 70% to reject the paper or not. So write it with a lot of time and uh, preparation. Okay, so I think this slide is also very helpful to you. Um, in this slide, uh, what we had sent uh, as editors in chief to the reviewers, what we expect from the reviewers. So, if you know how the reviewers is, are evaluating your paper, you might write your paper in a more efficient way. So, I'm not uh, reading all of them because you will have this uh, in the uh, videos. I see that the video, uh, the presentation is recorded, so you can read that uh, in your office with time. Uh, if you get the reviewer reports, the golden rule is be polite, answer with evidence and be thorough. Being polite is absolutely important. We have a blind review process, you don't see the reviewer, sometimes the reviewers are harsh, uh, but still, you should be, remain polite. And you should answer with evidence. You should always give not your belief and say, I believe it's correct, even if the author says, or the reviewer says, oh, there is evidence in this paper that this doesn't work. You cannot say, oh, I, I believe it's correct. It's not enough. You have to give evidence. And you should be thorough. You should give everything in detail. So here are some uh, statements how we suggest how you should handle reviews. You should always start with, we agree with the referee that. So then he is happy. And then comma, but. And then you put your own point. The referee is right to the point out, etc. yet. And then your criticism co comes. Another possibility is, whilst we agree with the referee, so you will, uh, give credit to the referee that, and then you go with the other topic. It's true that, but. We acknowledge that our paper might have been, but. We too were disappointed by the low response rate, however. We agree that it is an important area that requires further research. We support that, we support the referee's assertion that although and then you can give your criticism so that's that's the way how you should handle uh, the reviewers uh, how do you respond to a review there are different ways one is shown here you write the reviewers comment the editors comment the reviewers comment here in the text and then with an arrow you show your comment that's one way. And it's always clear what was the comment, what is the reaction of the authors. Or you write it like this, reviewer's comment, you write the comment of the reviewer, and then you write author's comment and write your comment here. Another way which I like uh, at most is you make a table where the comment number is given in one column, and then you have the comment of the reviewer, and then your corrections or response to the reviewer's comment. And then, if you submit the revised article, make clear what part you have revised, either by color, like here, or 
by making it in a different uh, under color, like here. And in that way, you can achieve that uh, the editor can understand what has been changed uh, in the manuscript. Okay, issues of originality that has been also mentioned by uh, Timo, fabrication, falsification, plagiarism, you know that there are software packages which check uh, the overlap with other papers, uh, not only published papers, they look also to conferences and so on. So uh, there is now a quite a strong uh, checking mechanism, but that hasn't to do anything with checking. It's your own responsibility to be honest, to be thorough, and to give only your work and not something from somebody else. It's your responsibility. It's your character. It's the requirement of a scientist, of a researcher, to be honest, to not steal something from anyone else and to show things as if they are your own. So it doesn't have to do with the police actions we have in the journals to check uh, the overlaps and uh, other papers and so on. Uh, those are only tools, but it is it must be in your heart. Don't do that. Don't do that. Yeah, with that, I'm at the end of my uh, presentation. I think I'm exactly at the time uh, which was scheduled. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your attention, and I would be happy to answer questions and uh, discuss with you uh, these issues. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Professor Kaya, for your very insightful uh, sharing as well. <laughs> and Timo, uh, too, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, my, I myself, I learned a lot. Uh, <laughs> I learned so many things about the reviewers' comments edit, <clears throat> and then uh, what to do with it and uh, the publishing, some, some, some of the best practices when we are trying to publish uh, our manuscript. So we already received right now around 30 plus questions. Um, and then I have some questions also coming to me an anonymously. And in total, we actually have like 70 plus questions, <laughs> which I think we will not be able to answer all of these questions. Uh, so let me pick and choose uh, some of these questions. Uh, and then uh, let's see uh, uh, who is uh, the best person to answer, uh, to answer this. Okay. So um, let's go with the first one. We have some uh, questions, couple of questions regarding references. Um, I think this can... Hi, John. Sorry to bother you. I think your camera is not switched on. Oh, uh, sorry, Sonam. Can you turn... I just did try to do it now. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, John. Yeah, okay. So we have a couple of questions about references, and maybe this can be uh, for Timo. Yeah, so do you have any suggestions on number of references that um, usually will be acceptable? And also self-citation. Do you have like numbers or percentage that you would recommend? Um, so th there's, there's no such thing as a fixed number, I would say. But um, as mentioned earlier, it's, it's really important to only have the essential and appropriate references. And when it comes to self-citation, um, there are, th there's a committee on publication ethics that's uh, called COPE, that's C-O-P-E. And they have on their web pages, they have um, quite some, uh, a number of guidelines on what is considered to be a, a, yeah, appropriate when it comes to, to self-citation. So I would be happy also to include this in the materials, uh, a link to that page and that, uh, that, that people can really check it for themselves as well. Um, but again, uh, one of the most important things there are, are really, it should be appropriate and um, it should not never be only self-promotional. I think that that is a very important thing to, to take into consideration. Hmm. Okay, so uh, we also follow a uh, quote with uh, self-citations. Uh, apologies for this. We, we also follow a code uh, ethics for the self citation. Yes, all of our all of the journals that we publish um, basically adhere to the COPE guidelines when it comes to ethical questions. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Maybe, maybe I can add to Timo um, from my point. So if I write a paper with my uh, students, what, what I try to tell them, just write references which are useful for your work. So do not start with Adam and Eva uh, uh, citing. You should cite the fundamental references which you have used to develop your work. And if you do that, you will very quickly see that um, there, there is a finite number of references which are cited. So don't cite um, the friend of your professor because uh, he will be happy. Uh, don't cite uh, possibly the editor. That's also something which we see a lot. Uh, people cite the editor because they think if the editor is cited in the paper, he will treat the paper uh, much better. Uh, this is not the case. Uh, only cite things which are related to your research work and which improve or which are the basis for your research and not any irrelevant work. And if you do that, you end up with really a reasonable finite number of uh, uh, public uh, publications you can cite, which depends on the work. So you might have publications where you have uh, 15 references, you might have publications where you have 150 publications. So it's a wide range, as Timo said, and uh, the important thing is every publication should have a reason why you have cited it. And what I see, we call that mass publication, which you should avoid definitely. Uh, so if a young researcher writes a paper, uh, and the first thing I see is he writes a paper, uh, metalforming is important, and then makes a bracket and writes 1 to 15, bracket closed, and uh, that's, I, I mean, that's not a citation. Uh, that's an anonymous citation that shows that the author has read the paper, congratulations, but that doesn't help the reader. So you should write if you write reference a paper, I read the paper one by Tekaya, and he found that aluminum is a light metal. Okay, so that's important. And we use that in our work. The references should be like that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Tim. Okay. So it's, it's not the battle of how many references that you can use <laughs> for your research article. Okay, thank you. So uh, coming to the next questions. Um, I think this can be for both Prof. Takaya and Timo as well. So should we, when we write uh, our research articles, should we focus on our main reference only? Or should we focus, let's say, on five or six, six references that somehow uh, correlate with our research, but not, oh, not, not as a whole? What would be the best uh, approach? Focus on one or a couple of references. Timo, if you have understood the question, please go on. I, I haven't understood the question very well. No, I'm 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 not entirely sure either. Um, but if I understand it, if if my understanding is correct, then the question is what the focus should be, and I think the focus really should be on. Um, what the researcher, what the author wants to contribute to the to the scientific record, to the scientific community. And I think that that should be the main focus. And I I doubt that the focus should be on the references. I think the references are there to support the the work that has been created. And I think that that would be the right way to. To, to, to go about and it shouldn't be the other way around that you focus first on the reference and then right so it's it's really initially the the, the it's it's of course important to know um, right what are the latest findings to, to do that literature literature research um, and of course then decide whether or not you think you've done research that is publishable. So that's really that's really the starting point, but yeah, I, I hope that this answers the question uh, somewhat. Okay, thank you, Timo. Yeah, I, I do think it's it answer the question because it's mostly about uh, where the focus should be. Is it 
uh, should be like uh, on the references on how many how many that we should use or should we really focus on what you just explained and I, I think it, that uh, is a very great explanation okay so the next one is um, okay uh, can you elaborate more about short communication what is short communication so short communications are really um, yeah the, the, the shorter articles that try to communicate early findings uh, in a work. So it's it's sometimes it's even considered work in progress. And um, I mean journals. The in, intention of a journal, in in the essence, is really to communicate within the community the findings of of research. And this is research in an earlier stage so it's shorter work it's um yeah it's 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 really these early type of findings um that are then communicated and later it could be turned into a full research article it could also be useful to other researchers within the community to right to to to, to build on as well um so i think that that is the main difference in so any any researchers could uh, decide if they want to publish short communication. Technically, I would. Uh, yeah. So maybe to add to Timo's point, uh, I, I think there is also one group of short communications uh, which are made for commenting commenting uh, other work. For for instance, if I have written a paper and uh, Timo found a mistake in the paper. Uh, he can write a short communication and say, oh, uh, in the paper of Tekaya, uh, equation three and four uh, have been wrongly derived and uh, because the assumption was wrong, the correct assumption is that, and if we use the correct assumption, this is a derivation. That could be a short uh, communication. So in the past, uh, as I was young, uh, a young student, uh, there were a lot of such short communications because people were not traveling as much as today and they answered always by that kind of communications. So that's a group of uh, papers uh, which is very special, but then we have, as Timo said, also research papers that are short communications, work in progress, and uh, or a very tiny uh, physical invention uh, which is made, uh, which doesn't suffice for a whole paper. And in those short communications, we do not ex expect all the items in a regular paper. So uh, you might make also only a proposal without a proof, okay, without a validation. That could be also part of a short communication. Okay, thank you, thank you, uh, Timo and Prof. Takaya. So the next one, I think this can go to Prof. Takaya. How to politely reply to a reviewer if they ask us to do additional experiment, but we don't but we think that it's not necessary or we don't have time. <laughs> That's a difficult question. Let, let me tell you a story uh, from one of my papers. Uh, as, as I was a young researcher, I made a work in biomechanics and uh, we analyzed the skull of a young uh, boy. So we made a tomography of the skull and wrote the paper and then the reviewer wrote back and said, Oh, uh, it's not enough to make a vertical skull, uh, uh, scan, you have to make also a horizontal scan. And uh, but we received that uh, review after one and a half years. And the uh, young uh, boy who we analyzed was meanwhile three years older, okay? So his skull was completely different. So I wrote back to the reviewer very politely, we cannot do that because the boy grow up uh, and then, you know, that's impossible. How can you not do what I said? And he reject the paper. Okay, so <laughs> it's it's a difficult question. Uh, but if you if you say I have no time, that's not a good idea. A paper needs time. Nobody uh, can have a time schedule and say, oh, I need the paper tomorrow. Accept it because my promotion is uh, two days later. Uh, that's no argument. And it's also no argument to say, oh, that's a lot of work, okay? Of course, research is a lot of work. Uh, you should have other arguments. You should have arguments like, uh, yeah, even if we would do that experiment, we 
that would bring us uh, only this information, which is rather minor. So, uh, and and the uh, work we have to input there is so much, uh, so we suggest not to do that. And then you can write, but if the reviewer insists on that, of course we will do it, okay? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Prof. Takaya. Okay. Uh, another question is about salami slicing. So the case is, um, this uh, um, researcher asks, if I use one big topic, like an umbrella topic, and then I produce a couple of research under this one big topic, would that be considered as salami slicing? It's um, yeah, it, it, it's it's difficult to uh, to to comment on this um, in in this manner. I would say because it's it's I, I don't know what necessarily the topic is, but salami slicing is basically that you produce multiple papers out of what really should be and, and could be covered within one paper. So it's one piece of research, and it's really sliced into all of these different articles. And one, one of them is submitted to this journal, another is to another. And that's, that's, that's considered an unethical uh, practice. And it's, it's very much discouraged. So all of these papers also have quite some similarities in that sense, with minor distinctions between them. And that in short is, is what is considered uh, salami slicing. And yeah, that, that, that's just a practice that's, that's not considered an ethical practice. But I'm, I'm sure that Professor Takai also uh, oh, has. I, I think you explained it very well. Uh, I mean, uh, if I understood the question, if the topic is very big and you select subtopics and publish the subtopics, that's not salami slicing. Uh, every topic should be consistent in itself and should have some a knowledge transfer, that's fine. But if you take a topic and only bring at every paper one or two new figures, one or two new results, that's some unslicing. So if you think you have in the paper probably 20 figures and tables, and uh, then you write a new paper with uh, 18 figures from the old paper, or even five figures from the old paper, uh, and bring some very few new uh, figures and results that would be salami slicing. Okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, uh, I think we can only have two more questions to be answered because we do have uh, time uh, limitations here. So let me go with uh, this one. How many times authors are usually given the opportunity to improve the article from reviewer's comment? Because previously I had revised the manuscript twice, but after that it was rejected by the editor because of the novelty issue. Okay, so it's it's an interesting question. I think in general, um, my recommendation is always that we that we limit the number of times that a paper can go for a revision round. Um, but of course, there are loads and loads of journals out there, and with different editors, with different preferences and with different ways of working. So it's very well possible. I've seen papers in certain journals that, that have gone for nine revision rounds. Personally, I don't think that, that is something that makes the editor happy, that makes the author happy, and makes the reviewers happy, right? So in general, my recommendation is always to try and keep it um, to a minimum. And, and in, in my experience, I think, if a paper is not ready to be accepted after two revisions, then I right, ideally, I think it should be rejected. Okay, thank you, thank you, Timo. Okay, so uh, questions that we have. If a study is using a traditional method never been published be before, can, can that method be said to be a new one? So it's already in the um, in, in it's already known maybe by local communities, but it's never been published. So can it be said as a new matter? Um, yeah, uh, I have to be careful. If it is uh, not published, so it cannot be known. Uh, but if it has published 
and it is used in another field uh, for another product that's not original that's just an application of the no known knowledge uh, but I mean, if you, for instance, discover um, in the antique uh, Greece or uh, in uh, other parts of the world uh, a methodology um, to make, for instance, a farming process, um, which is known for thousands of years in that country and has been never published scientifically, then it's new, of course. That's, that's something new. But if you use something which is known by everyone, then it must be published in textbooks or in seminars somewhere, then it's not new. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor Kaya. Okay, so I think we'll come to the end uh, of our discussion session, yeah, Professor Kaya and also Timo. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think not only from your explanation, but during this uh, session, we learned a lot. Yeah, we have answered uh, not all questions because again, if we answer all, it will be until tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> we will not stop this session. Yeah, so for that, uh, again, thank you so much. I believe everyone learned a lot. Yeah, and uh, uh, apology for participants here because we we don't have enough time to answer everyone's questions. But hopefully, uh, this session we are both from uh, Timo and also Prof. Kaya. They are really beneficial for all of you. So again, thank you, Prof. Kaya. Thank you, Timo. Okay, so for participants, yeah, we are coming to the end of this session. But before I end our webinar, I would like to uh, ask you to fill in our, our post-event survey and also uh, how to download uh, e-certificates that we have provided. So for that, let me share my screen. Okay, so first uh, we do have our post-event survey yeah? and this is the link and also the QR code. So you can just uh, scan the QR code uh, to answer uh, some of our uh, post event survey, we would really appreciate your opinions, your comments, yeah, uh, so we can provide better uh, session next time. Yeah, our uh, my colleague, yeah. Uh